Well, hey, y'all. How y'all doing? Thank you so much for coming to my talk on leadership. I, I hope it's entertaining and valuable to you. And I am so excited to be here at the very first NDC Minnesota, the first time in Minnesota. Um, didn't know hot dish was a thing. That's pretty awesome. Uh, just cover something with tater tots and call it done, right? <clears throat> so at my previous company, we had this thing about punching bears. Um, it was all about doing hard things, doing scary things, and generally just being awesome. We would, you know, often say, get out there and punch some bears today. But in real life, punching bears is probably not such a great idea as it will only provoke the bear to maul you worse than before. And this has nothing to do with the talk that I'm giving. I just thought you would like some free advice. So some of you are just so excited to be here at the conference. You've been soaking up content uh, so far, and you can't wait to continue going to some more talks and then, you know, with your new knowledge, go back to work next week or later this week and just unleash your new knowledge on your unsuspecting coworkers. Others of you, on the other hand, may be feeling just a little bit um, overwhelmed because you're thinking, how in the world am I going to learn all this new stuff? How am I going to convince my boss to allow me to use any of this cool technology, and then you've got me and the rest of the conference, you know, to give you more and more information. Um, well, I could tell you, you know, where I see technology going in five years, but that's be about as accurate as the weather forecast. Uh, IoT is a very hot topic. We could talk about, you know, how we should be con connecting everything in our homes to the cloud and um, you know, how, how really cool and awesome that would be. Uh, I do a lot of JavaScript and you know, we could talk about the latest JavaScript frameworks and uh, how you know, something that was created just yesterday is the new standard for the whole internet and to forget what, what you're doing. But what if I told you that Regardless of the technology that you know, and regardless of the title that you have, regardless of how long you've been in the industry or if you're brand new to the industry, that you have amazing potential to impact your workplace and your community and the entire world in powerful and meaningful ways. So I want to lead off by telling you a little bit of. A, a short story about myself, um, a cautionary tale, if you will. When I started my career, I was doing a mix of IT and programming, and I absolutely loved solving problems and fixing things. And I couldn't believe that I got paid to do the stuff that I did. It was so much fun. And but a funny thing happened. I was promoted to a management position, and I hated it. All I wanted to do was to write code. And believe it or not, I'm an introvert. And uh, doing things like getting out and talking to uh, my subordinates, you know, the people who report to me, and, you know, asking them what they're working on, how things are going, that kind of stuff. That was just not even remotely in my nature. And I resented the role. I resented the responsibilities. I did the bare minimum to get by. I spent most of my time coding and it's like, you know, one little bit I would I would try to have meetings or, you know, talk to my, my teammates. So within 18 months, I took a straight programming job making less money. And this cycle of promotion to management and the despair and changing jobs, it repeated itself several times. And my, my, my wife would ask me, 
what do you have against making more money? Well, my ideal job consisted of give me the most powerful computer, give me a virtually unlimited supply of caffeinated beverages, and then stand back while I sling some code. Can I get an amen? Right. You know what I'm talking about. And it wasn't until many years later that through some mentoring, through some training, maybe a little bit of maturity, that I began to realize that my attitude towards leadership or everything out of just cranking out code needed an attitude adjustment. So I, I've had to come to terms with being a leader. And I want to give you some things that I've learned along the way. Now, you may think, what I used to think, that man, leadership is only for management. And for the longest time, I didn't want to have anything to do with management. But leadership is not just for management, not to say that there aren't some aspects of management that are leadership. You know, there's some, there's some overlap there. And if you're in a management role, there's, you know, there's expectations for you to be a leader. But I'm here to tell you, in case you didn't already know, that leadership is for all y'all. And if you're not from the South, like I am, that speak fluent redneck, there's you, there's you, one person, there's y'all, which is maybe a few, and then everybody is all y'all. That's everybody. So there are qualities and skills of being a leader that we all need to learn. A couple of years ago uh, at my previous company, a group of us completed a one-year leadership program at uh, the Scarlet in Leadership Institute in Nashville, Tennessee, and our group was named the Emerging Leaders, And every, but every time I saw Emerging Leaders come across email or Slack or whatever, and I thought Emerging looked kind of like Irma Gerd. <laughs> and so that's what I secretly called our little group, and, uh, you know, touchy-feely, let's go and do the come by y'all stuff, and but it, it actually turned out to be a really great program. Every six weeks, we'd go to an offsite training, and we'd learn some new leadership skill, um, team dynamics, communication, conflict resolution, all kinds of stuff. I highly recommend, uh, you know, finding a program like this, encouraging your your company to uh, to sponsor something like this because I, I learned a lot and we grew as a as a group uh, really close together. To give you an example, in one of these uh, sessions, we learned about negotiation. We role played. We got into teams of pairs of teams, and we were given some documentation, um, kind of like a legal document showing our side of the story, a little bit about, a little reconnaissance about the other team that we were going up against. That's convenient. And uh, the desired outcome of the negotiation that we, that our team was expecting. And each round of this role playing uh, taught us specific skills about, um, about being a good negotiator. We learned things like uh, the importance of doing research, about knowing all the information that you can about what you're negotiating for and about the people that you're negotiating with. About BATNA, which is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's a silly way of saying know when to walk away. Um, if you understand your best alternative, you know exactly when the deal is no longer in your favor and you can say, okay, I'm out. And then also um, another key concept is this idea of anchoring a negotiation with terms in your favor. It's, it's usually whoever makes the first move, whoever makes the first bid, so to speak, to say this is what we think, you know, is fair. The whole negotiations from that point forward are anchored around that initial um, number. And so if you can be the first one to put your number out, then it's in your favor. At the end of the day, our instructor cautioned us that the negotiation skills that we had learned were extremely powerful and to use our new powers for good and not for evil. 
Well, about a month later, I found myself in the market for a new vehicle. I did my research. I knew what I wanted. I understood all the options, and I knew what to expect from my adversary. I knew that I could walk away from a deal that wasn't better than my BATNA, my best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And an opportunity presented itself the same day that I got a cavity filled. I saw a used truck at a car dealership close to where I was going to my dentist. And after, um, after I got my, my cavity filled and still numbed up on you know one side, not being able to, to function, uh, it, I went to this dealership and it didn't take long for one of their sharks to, you know, I don't even think I had fully gotten out of my vehicle before they were already on top of me. And he says, what brings you in today? Which is how we all talk in the South. <laughs> um, I said, well, I just finished getting a cavity filled and I'm interested in one of your used trucks. And he said, buddy, research says that two things that people hate to do the most is go to the dentist and shop for a new car. You're doing both in the same day. You must be tough. Indeed, I am. And I jumped ahead of myself. Ah, I missed my jokes. So we went, he made the mistake of letting me take the first strike. And I anchored the deal with a number that I was confident, based on my research, was really close to, you know, the what they had invested in the truck itself, close to their bottom line. And I had a lot more firepower in, from my training at my disposal. And after the dust had settled, I owned the exact truck that I wanted, and I knew I could easily turn around and sell that same truck that day for at least $2,000 more than what I had just paid, minimum. Walking away from a, a good deal, knowing that you got a good deal, that's an awesome feeling. And negotiation is a, a leadership skill that you can learn that will definitely help you in life and on for your team. It, being able to negotiate on behalf of your team, behalf of your organization, you know, for th you know things to to go better in your favor, that's that's a pretty awesome skill to have. One of the books that our leadership group went through was The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. In this book, he describes three virtues that every leader or every uh, great employee must possess. And this book can not only help you to identify uh, and hire the best employees, but maybe the same as it did for me, it helped me to identify and really understand some, ver you know, these virtues in my own life and see where I needed to make some improvements to be the very best team player, the very best employee that I could be. So in this book, uh, just to give you a TLDR, um, the, the first and most important virtue is humility. Characteristics of humility include not having an inflated ego, uh, not having you know, less concern about yourself, uh, can caring more about the team than than you do yourself, eager to share credit with others, and humility, however, is a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have this opposite of humility. You have people who are arrogant and self-centered, and they're politicians who create division and re resentment among people they come in contact with. On the other end of the spectrum, and this is what I found most interesting, is that you have people who appear to be humble, but who can be just as damaging to your team. They discredit their own talents, the, the, the value that they bring to their team, and they won't point out problems when they see them because they feel like their opinion is of no value. And uh, I'm sad to say that this is kind of the, the end of the spectrum that I used to fall on quite a bit. I, I just didn't feel like my ideas were worth bringing up or my input was of much value. <clears throat> One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, had this to say about humility. Um, 
The heart of being humble is unselfish motivation for your team and for your customers. When you truly want the best outcome for everyone around you, you are acting with humility. The second virtue is hungry. And unfortunately, it's not referring to food. I would, man, I would excel off the charts in that area if that were true. Hungry is about passion. Hungry is characterized by, you know, taking ownership of work and being just diligent. But again, it's it's a kind of a spectrum of behavior. To one extreme, you've got a person who's completely dominated by their work at the detriment of everything and everyone around them. And, you know, they, they, their identity becomes their work. You know, work is who they are. That's, that's what consumes them. And um, I've spent some time in my career being really, really driven about putting my work ahead of people in my family and, uh, and, and ahead of, you know, motivations, ahead of the benefit of the rest of my team. On the other side, you've got a person who has no motivation, no pa passion. They probably have a limp handshake, and they're just doing barely uh, the bare minimum to get by. So, you know, you don't want either one of those people. You want somebody in the middle who's who's a bit balanced and um, has has great passion, but also, you know, has good understanding about, you know, not being um, too far to one side or the other. The third value or the third virtue is smart. And this is not about intelligence, uh, but common sense regarding people. We hear, you know, you may have heard people talk about emotional intelligence or emotional IQ or something like that. That's kind of along the lines of what uh, Patrick Lencioni is talking about in this book. So it's in, characterized by active listening, being engaged, asking great questions. Uh, being sensitive about how your words and your actions affect others, just having awareness, you know, outside of yourself, um, and having empathy for your coworkers and, and your customers. Uh, you know, a great way to sum this up is just having respect for other people. So here's a Venn diagram of all three virtues because every, it's an unwritten rule that any book on any, uh, you know, talk on leadership has got to include a Venn diagram. And you can't do, you know, you can't stop me. But humility and passion, diligence, empathy, sensitivity, res respect for people, uh, these are all choices that you can make and all things that you can strive to do and get better at. And the skill, they're skills that you can develop. And by doing so, you not only become an indispensable employee, you can inspire others to do what you've done. You become a leader. Did you know that different people have different personalities? <laughs> <clears throat> different people have different behaviors, have different ways of seeing the world, and they process information um, differently. They make how they make decisions, how they respond to conflict. And our industry seems to attract a lot of people with, let's say, suboptimal people skills. We can be productive and get quite far in our careers just on our technical skills alone. And most of us, including myself, are far more comfortable talking to our computers than we are with irrational, emotional people, right? Um, it's it's tough uh, being a, a you know working with with other people sometimes. Um, so a key takeaway for you know that I'm going to give you is that there are many behavior and personality assessments available that can help you to gain insight into yourself and to other people. My favorite so far is DISC, and DISC stands for a bunch of words that I don't remember what they mean. But what this um, DISC personality assessment does is it gives you personality traits, insight into people's behaviors, and 
people being action oriented versus, you know, people focused and reserved and task focused and a blend of, you know, different elements of the spectrum. Now, you know, it's not an exact science. Um, not, you know, no personality assessment is, you know, 100% accurate. However, it does help you and your team understand how each person responds to conflict, how they like to receive and process information, what are the best ways to communicate uh, with a person effectively. And it's a fantastic tool that can help you uh, understand people different from yourself. For example, some people are really deep thinkers and they don't like surprises. Going into a meeting and announcing some big change and then in immediately expecting them to give you their input is not how they like to operate. They need time to process new information before they can formulate an opinion and give feedback. And usually that feedback is really, really good because they can really think deeply about it. Now, you need people who are gung ho and take charge and, or, you know, take initiative and action, but you also need people who can think deeply about problems and um, keep your gung ho folks grounded. So, understanding behavior and personalities can go a long way to helping you empathize with your coworkers. It can also help you to influence others because you know how best to communicate with them and their personality. And it's having a better understanding of your own personality can be a, a really awesome tool that helps you to be, uh, to be more strategic in your workplace. Just being able to articulate to your boss, hey, this is the best way you can communicate with me, that can make a huge difference. Learning how other people process information and communicate and respond to conflict and puts you in an amazing position of influence and leadership. What's your greatest weakness? Don't you just love that question? You'll be in a job interview or, um, you know, performance review and up pops the question and you try to be, you know, all clever. You know, it's, you know, it's going to happen. So you, you try to like, well, you know what? I, my greatest weakness is I just work too hard. I can't help it. I just have to get things done on time or it just, it just kills me. I, I don't, it's a curse, I suppose. So another powerful tool that can help you is this Strengths Finder. This book and assessment is a um, result of years and tens of thousands of uh, surveys performed by Gallup Research. Each one of you has unique talents and knowledge and skills. The Strengths Finder is designed to help you identify your top five gifts, your top five skills, and maximize those. Because according to Tom Rath and, the, and Gallup Research, is that if you spend a lot of time focusing on your weaknesses, you don't care as much about your weaknesses and you don't put as much energy into your weaknesses and all and all kinds of reasons. But you the best you can hope for is to be mediocre with your weaknesses. When you're not able to use your strengths at work, chances are you are not going to be motivated. You're going to have negative interactions with your coworkers. You're not going to achieve as much and you're going to not be creative or feel like you're doing you're, that, that you're getting anywhere. But discovering and focusing on your five strengths, on the other hand, will have far greater impact. When you're in an environment where you're allowed to embrace and utilize your five top strengths, you will be 100% more likely to be engaged and more active and more creative. And you will feel awesome about the work that you do. Again. This is an incredible tool that can that you and your team can use to discover how you complement each other and how you can all agree on how to maximize the the strengths that you have. 
Let's talk about multitasking. Our culture seems to be fixated on multitasking. We put, we put it in our job descriptions. We put it on our resumes. The truth is none of us are as good at multitasking as we think we are, no matter how, we, how much we try to convince ourselves. Our industry talks a lot about 100% utilization. We need every employee 100% utilized. We can't be wasting time. Time is money. But let me ask you, what's a highway at 100% utilization? It's a parking lot. And it's not just my opinion. It's math. It's true for traffic. It's true for electricity. It's true for fluid dynamics. And it's true for people. Kids love going to the circus. Big kids, you know, grown-ups, they like it too. And it's exciting to see this idiot get into a cage with a real lion and try to get, you know, the lion, try to convince the lion not to maul him to death. Now, the whip is cool, but what's, what's the deal with the chair? He's always got this chair. It turns out that the whip does nothing for the lion. The, the whip is for the audience. Kids think, oh, I want a whip, right? Um, I want to be Indiana Jones. The, the chair is for the lion. Lions have incredible powers of focus. That's what helps them in the wild to be the predators that they are. And when you put the four legs of a chair in a lion's face, the lion can't decide which of those four legs that he needs to be worried about. And so essentially, the lion becomes paralyzed with fear or par paralyzed with indecision. And we are much the same way. When we have too much work on our plate, we, ha we have too many tasks that we're trying to juggle at the same time, our brains become overloaded. We think we can switch from one task to another, but our brains don't work that way. Our brains don't stop thinking about those other problems. They haunt us, even in our sleep. Now, how many times have you woke up, you know, the next morning and say, aha, I know how to solve that problem? Well, it's because our brains don't stop thinking about it, even when we're, you know, they're part of our subconscious. Um, it may sound counterintuitive, but... Do everything in your power to limit the work that you do to one thing at a time. You will get more work done faster and at higher quality than trying to juggle too many things at once. You ever heard of the Dilbert Principle? The most ineffective workers are systematically promoted to a position where they'll do the least amount of damage, management. So early in my career, I had a boss who exemplified the Dilbert principle. I really didn't like the man, personally or professionally. His incompetence was legendary. He was notoriously bad. Mistakes were named after him. Um, names changed to protect not the not-so-innocent but yet he still continued to rise in rank and responsibilities. A lot of the work I was required to do under this, under his direction was of no value to anyone. Um, for example, I was asked to create documentation for every method, every store procedure uh, that, that in the code that we were writing. And no one was ever going to read this, ever. Meaningless and pointless work is soul crushing. I toughed it out for more than a year. I tried to find ways of getting out from under him, but with no relief in sight, I took another job. And I thought to myself, life is too short to work somewhere that stinks. And I started living by that philosophy and I started offering it to others when I'd hear them complaining about the jobs that they had. 
In technology, we are extremely fortunate that we are in such high demand that we have the luxury of being able to decide when and where we want to work, right? It's not that case in every profession. The problem is that idea began to pollute my perspective. And when things started to go south, when things went sour, I would start to think, well, here we go again. Time to start looking for a new job. Years later, I was in a similar situation. I was unhappy. I started interviewing uh, at other companies, and there was a really attractive job offer on the table. And I was trying to decide if I should accept. And that's when my wife asked me two questions that stopped, stopped me in my track. Have you done everything that you can do? And if you left now, would you have any regret? I declined the job offer, and I took ownership of the situation, and I committed to doing everything in my power uh, to make my team successful. In the end, I did leave that job a year later, but I left having absolutely no regrets and being very proud of what we had accomplished. It had been one of the most prolific years in my entire career. Now, sure, there can be toxic environments. There can be career-limiting situations. There can be times when you have just an, an incredible opportunity that comes along that can justify changing jobs. But for anything else, I've adopted a new mindset. Life is too short to let things stay the way they are. We've all heard the phrase, well, that's not my job, right? I've learned that taking ownership and responsibility is always the right thing to do. And it has far-reaching effects. It's, I've learned that it's okay to be honest with your management, your leadership, and to, and to ask the questions, is there anything that I can do that can, that can help you? It's always the right time to do the right thing. And in doing so, by taking ownership and taking responsibility and doing the right thing, regardless if it's in your job description or not, that's, that makes you a leader in other people's eyes. Every now and again, good folks leave, um, really good ones. And regardless of the circumstances, we let them know how much we appreciate um, their contributions and how much they mean to us and that they will be greatly missed. About a year ago, it struck me when one of these really awesome people left the company I was at, um, well, why don't we do this more often? Why don't we let people know just how awesome they are and, and what kind of impact that they're having on, our, on us and on our, our company? Maybe if we told them how much they were valued, they wouldn't be leaving. So I decided to run an experiment. Every Friday, I would post on Slack a tribute to one of my coworkers and describing what kind of impact that they had had on me and some kind of, you know, anecdote or something to recognize them. Nakoda was our customer support manager. And as one person described, he does the work of 10,000 men. Nakoda consistently went above and beyond to make our customers happy. He is awesome. Now, the drawing isn't that important. It's just something fun that I like to do. And the things that I said about each person were usually not all that earth shattering either. The real magic. Now, you know, I want you to get this. The real magic was everything else, what everyone else said all day long throughout the day, personal stories, encouragement, High fives, just story after story. It was beautiful. All I did was start the conversation. 
This experiment lasted for about a year, and I had so many people thank me for and, and let me know that it was so special to be honored and recognized in that way, to be celebrated by their peers. You see, every one of us wants to know that the things that we do matter, that we have significance, that we have value. And encouraging, you know, encouragement highlights a person's strengths. It's, it's positive reinforcement. What does, what does that person that you're encouraging now want to do? They want to go do more of that awesome stuff that got them recognized. They want to keep feeling that feeling of making an impact, of making a difference uh, in someone else's life. Now, if you know me, you know I can't go for very long without talking about bacon. So I've submit to you the highest award, award for excellence, the bacon award. When you encourage someone or a team of people, they will continue to improve and create amazing results. And they go on to inspire other people to do the same. And those people go on to inspire even more. Just a little bit of encouragement can go a long way and can set off a course of a chain reaction of good and positive things. Now, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. There wasn't a whole lot of encouragement going around. And encouragement has never come natural to me. This is yet another skill that I've had to learn, and it's something that you can learn too. So let me show you. Imagine you have a coworker named Mary. Mary, I want you to know just how much I appreciate all the database work that you do for us. And not only that, but you're always smiling and you're always an encouragement. It means a lot to me and everyone around you. Thank you so much. Paul, thank you for always being willing to help. I know I can always count on you and to help me when I'm stuck. It means a lot to me. You are awesome. Thank you. Mark, thank you for um, wearing deodorant <laughs> and coming to work fully clothed. Uh, keep it up. See, it's it's not that hard. You know, if there's someone that you know who has impacted you in some way, either recently or in the past, let them know. Don't wait until it's too late. There are three things inevitable in life. There's death, taxes, and PowerPoint. <laughs> Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Uh, whether it's speaking to your team or at a wedding or at a meetup, or even you have aspirations of speaking at a conference, you'll have to stand up in front of a group of people and present some information. Happens all the time. I mean, we talk one-on-one -on -one and with our group all the time. It's public speaking is just another elevated form of, of, um, of communication. But it's, it's really hard. So in 2011, I finally got up the courage to give my first talk at a user group. And I stank. I was terrible. But a funny thing happened. I had a lot of people who came up to me afterwards and thanked me for sharing. I had people tell me that I did a good job, even though I knew for sure that I was the worst speaker in all speaker history. It took a while for it to sink in, but I learned a really valuable lesson about the power of community. There are people out there who are just, they're just really awesome at being human. They look past look past your mistakes and they see the good and potential that is within you and they keep encouraging you to not give up because when you do hard stuff everyone benefits 
I hope that every day I'm a little more like one of those kind of people where I'm encouraging and in helping people to, to get more awesome. This is one of my favorite quotes. When I gave my first talk, people didn't remember how I fumbled around with some configuration file, uh, some kind of demo failure. They, they remembered me, and they remembered that no matter how small or insignificant that it seemed, I helped them and their life in some way. In 2016, I had an incredible privilege of giving a keynote at Music City Code in Nashville, Tennessee. And I shared the same story about how I got started. I had more than one person come up to me after the, my, my talk and say, I was there. I remember when you gave your first talk. And you're right, you were terrible. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you might be thinking, I understand being asked or even forced to speak. Why would I, on any earthly planet, you know, want to volunteer to speak? But let me tell you, having someone not only understand your message, but then be inspired to go and do that thing that you're talking about, it's one of the most rare and precious rewards I have ever experienced. To have someone come up to me months or even years later to say, hey, I remember that talk that you gave, and I went on to do you know, something much bigger and more awesome than I could have ever imagined. That's, that's awesome. That's incredible. Public speaking is an amazing skill that you can learn that will set you apart that will open doors and opportunities and launch you ahead as a leader and influencer in your company and in your community. I can't, I, not, I can't even begin to describe all the benefits and opportunities that I've received since I started speaking. I would, I, it's, it's awesome. I've traveled the world. I've been able to meet so many people. I've been able to, you know, the last, Several jobs I've had have been because of the, you know, the opportunities that I've been given, connections I've made at conferences and speaking with other folks. But don't you wish sometimes you could just fast forward to the day when you've got it all together and you can do, you know, do all these awesome things, you know? Um, you know, the reality is there's no shortcut to success. You can't be a great speaker overnight, but you can start somewhere. You can't, you know, all these other leadership skills that I'm talking about is, you know, you have to start. And there's a compounding effect of the more you do and the better you get, the more value you're going to get out of the work that you put in. We get out of life in proportion to what we put into it. And I'm telling you these things about leadership, not so that you can go back and point your finger at all the things that your leaders are in your organization are lacking or not, a, you know, not doing well in or talk bad behind their backs or, or to say things like, boy, if I was in charge, things would be different around here. Um, I'm telling you these things so that you can take an honest look at yourself and Start asking some important questions. You know, what changes can I make um, to become the most valuable employee that my company has ever seen? You know, what changes can my team make where we could become the most valuable team that this company has? If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader, so said President Mutton Chops. None of these things require you to be a manager or have a fancy title or to have much skill. You can be a leader regardless 
of any any of those. 1982, Thanksgiving. Like it, most Thanksgivings, when I was young, younger, um, we got into my mom's car and we drove to my aunt's house uh, close to Atlanta, Georgia. You know, pretty good drive away from where we live. And we would have this great big family reunion. Um, and have, you know, turkey and, and all those kinds of things. And for me, it was just amazing. I got to see a lifestyle. I got to see a, a home and a family that was nothing like I knew. Um, and it was, I, I looked forward to every Thanksgiving because I knew I got to play with some of my cousins and do some awesome things. This particular fateful Thanksgiving, um, I discovered the TRS-80. My cousin had one of these, and um, I don't know if I spent the entire time at that Thanksgiving uh, banging on this keyboard, but I do know that it made quite an impression on my uncle. And sometime after um, Thanksgiving, my mom gets a call, and we got back in the car, and we drove back to my aunt's house. And waiting for me there was a big cardboard box with a TRS-80, um, a dot matrix printer, a cassette drive, a floppy drive, and this book. This one kind and very generous act launched me on a journey of computers and programming and a love for technology. Even the illustrations in this book surely inspired me in some way because now I love to draw. And um, I can assure you that if I ever write a book, it's going to be have, it's going to have a lot of full fun illustrations in it. I continue to be inspired by my aunt and uncle their example of investing not only in their family and their relatives, but in the lives of countless others. I cannot thank them enough for the impact that they've made on my life and in my career. You have an amazing opportunity to impact your family, your relatives, and your community. You never know if some small, seemingly small act of kindness can be the, the catalyst that launches a young person on their journey of a, a, a lifelong journey of exploration of joy and their livelihood. So this is my challenge to you. Regardless of the technology that you know, regardless of your age, regardless of the job title that you have, regardless of the experience or lack of experience, you have an amazing potential, an opp amazing opportunity to impact your workplace and your family and your community in powerful, meaningful, and significant ways. Go maximize your talents. Go take ownership and responsibility. Go be courageous. Go inspire others. Go and be awesome. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, if you have any questions, please come talk to me. I'd be glad to uh, to talk with you. Again, follow me on Twitter if you do the Twitter thing, Reverend Geek. Um, I'd love to interact with you. Uh, I also have some stickers in case anybody's interested. Some of my silly stuff. <laughs>